the e, an EUI, an EUI wide. Um, yes, this will be recorded by the way. I'm supposed to uh, make the announcements because I think it, it didn't reach you by email. Um, so we are coordinating an EUI wide uh, research cluster on democracy in the 21st century. Uh, this is a new uh, and largely redesigned research cluster with a number of new initiatives that you'll hear about in the next few weeks. Um, and I can think of a better way of kicking off this series of events than today's event um, and our two distinguished uh, speakers. We have the pleasure um, of having with us Christopher Bickerton and Carlo Invernizzi Accetti, who will present their book, Techno Populism, The New Logic of Democratic Politics, published this year by Oxford University Press. It's a book that makes a counterintuitive, if not a contrarian argument, and I love books that make such arguments, not least because they usually make for robust discussions in the uh, aftermath of the presentations. And with this in mind, we'll have first a presentation of the book, followed by some Q&A time to discuss the, the book itself and its arguments. Uh, then we'll have a coffee break, and after we'll have a second session uh, that can go on as much as we, we would like, during which we can discuss the broader implications of, of the book uh, more broadly. Um, so let me first introduce our speakers. Christopher Bickerton is Professor in Modern European Politics at the Department of Politics and International Studies at the University of Cambridge. He's also a fellow at Queen's College. He holds a PhD from Oxford and he transitioned, should I say, from Oxford to Cambridge um, via the University of Amsterdam and Sciences Po in Paris, where he has held various teaching positions. He's published very extensively on European matters, um, uh, first by publishing European Union Foreign Policy from Effectiveness to Functionality in 2011 with Palgrave. Um, he has then written European Integration from Nation States to Member States, published with Oxford University Press in 2012. But I also want to point out that he has written on these issues for the broader public, um, he has published a bestseller, uh, I've read on 2016, The European Union, A Citizen's Guide with Penguin. And uh, he recently embarked on the history of Europe since uh, 1989, about which he will tell us more tomorrow morning in a seminar uh, at the history department. Carlo Inverniziacetti is Associate Professor of Political Theory at the City College of New York, CUNY. He's Associate Researcher at the Center for European Studies uh, at the Institut d'Etudes Politiques uh, in Paris. And he's also visiting Associate Professor of European Politics at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. His interest spans politics, religion, and law. He has widely written on the role of religion in politics, first in Relativism and Religion, Why Democratic Societies Do Not Need Moral Absolutes, published with Columbia University Press in 2015, and more recently um, in What is Christian Democracy, Politics, Religion, and Ideology, published with, by Cambridge University Press in 2019. Uh, Carlo is currently starting a new project um, on the millennial left in the United States and in Europe, something which hopefully he will tell us more about if we manage to lure him back at the UI, something which usually is not too difficult, but I hope will succeed. And let me just say that it's a great pleasure for me personally to welcome uh, Carlo, who is a former colleague at uh, CUNY, and also Chris, whom I met in the same context. And before handing the floor over to them, please uh, join me in extending a very warm welcome to uh, Carlo and Chris. As yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nicola. Um, Carl and I are going to split the, the presentation up half and half. Um, so you'll have something like 20 minutes or so from me, uh, and then the same from, uh, from Carlo. So this book that we're presenting today, uh, got a copy of it here, Techno Populism, uh, The New Logic of Democratic Politics. It was published in February uh, of this year. Um, and obviously that means it was finished in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so as I've said to, to a number of, uh, of people, um, this is really the first opportunity that we've had to actually do an in-person event. I know it's a hybrid event and there's lots of people who I can see on the screen who are attending as well, uh, but it's really uh, extremely enjoyable on our part to do a real event. Um, we've presented this book online at a number of different places, um, at Sciences Po, which was very nice for us uh, because that's where the ideas for the book were conceived, also at the LSE, but online events are really not quite the same. So it's really a pleasure to, uh, to be here. It's also a pleasure um, particularly to be here at the EUI um, because 
Uh, there are some uh, figures associated with the EUI who served as great intellectual inspiration for us uh, in writing the book. Uh, there are also people who in the book we argue against um, uh, based here as well. So um, uh, as an intellectual um, space, the EUI has certainly been very present in, in some of the ideas that we, that we develop in the, uh, in the book. Now, as I said, um, this book was really conceived back in, well, I suppose the, the germ of the idea was back in 2012. Both um, Carlo and myself were, were based in Paris at the time. Um, and some of the ideas for this book were first developed in many conversations we had in, in some of the cafes that can be found more or less between the Boulevard Saint-Germain and the Bon Marché sort of uh, um, shopping mall, if you want to call it like that. Um, all the best books, I think, are probably conceived in cafes around a beer or a, or a coffee. And certainly that was the case for, uh, for this one. Uh, we then went our separate ways, uh, but we still managed to, to work on this um, uh, by meeting occasionally and really thrashing out some of the main ideas. Um, people, I think, have different experiences of writing things together, and sometimes books are divided up. One person does one chapter, one person does another. That wasn't really our experience uh, with this one. Uh, we really worked on it together and developed the ideas together. Um, and then we wrote it up. But the end result is that it's quite difficult to identify which part is mine and which part is Carlo's. And so the division of labor that you see today is just a very um, theoretical division of labor. It doesn't really uh, reflect our respective interests or anything like that. Um, Co-authoring can be um, a trial, but in this case, it was a real uh, pleasure and an exhilarating experience. Uh, so I definitely recommend it to people if you're thinking about doing something like something like that. So let's talk about um, let's talk about techno techno populism. So the starting point for for our book, I suppose, uh, there are different ways that we can tell this story. But one way to to do it is. The starting point was this reflection around what has become known as the crisis of democracy, the crisis of representative democracy, um, uh, particularly. Now, I'm sure many of you here are, are fairly conversant in that literature. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anyone here who's really directly contributed to it, but I'm talking about the books you know, uh, by people like Daniel Ziblatt in the US on the, uh, the death of democracy, a colleague of mine in, in Cambridge, Dame, David Runciman has written about the end of democracy, that sort of, that sort of literature. Now, uh, we were always very sympathetic to, 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 to that debate, I suppose, in a sense. Um, and our starting point in a way is um, some arguments developed by somebody who was here, Peter Mayer, uh, and the first opening phrase of his book, Ruling the Void, was the age of party democracy has passed. But there were a couple of issues, I suppose, that we had with this crisis of democracy literature. One was that we felt that perhaps, in some sense, it was a little bit exaggerated, uh, which is that it seemed to, to us that you know advanced democracies were certainly experiencing um, profound transformation, but in other ways they were fairly resilient uh, and you could identify electoral turnover within the, the context of uh, written constitutions or unwritten constitutional norms. This was still taking place, so it seemed a bit of a, a push to argue about the end or the death of democracy. But we can, we can, you know, we can have a debate about that, but the main difficulty we had with that whole body of literature was that it tended to develop and focus on what we describe in the book as negative categories. It would talk about the end of, the disappearance of, the death of, so it definitely told us in very compelling ways what we had lost. But it didn't really give us the tools to understand what we have, and we still have elections, we still have parties, we still have political competition, um, and so, so in some sense it didn't seem that helpful to us to only understand the contemporary era in relationship to what has past. Uh, and so one of the goals of the, the book was to develop, if you like, some positive categories with which we can understand the contemporary, uh, the, the contemporary politics. Now, when we say positive categories, we don't mean positive as in normatively good, we mean positive as in existing, as in out there in the world that we can then try and develop and help us uh, understand the, the present. So developing these, uh, these positive uh, uh, categories is what we try and what we try and do. In a sense, just to, to, to try and simplify it, we take very seriously this phrase that we found in, um, uh, in, in one of the, uh, the classical texts by, by Schatzschneider, where he says, the only way we can understand 
politics is if we understand what the struggle is about. And we take that very seriously. And in some ways, our book is trying to say, this is what we think the struggle is about. It's not what it might have been about in the past, but it is still about something. And what is that, what is that something? And that's what we, try and, uh, what we try and identify. We try and answer that question about what is the struggle about. So one of the main claims that we make in the book uh, is essentially that um, generally we have thought about modern politics um, as a struggle between uh, ideologies, as a struggle between left, uh, left and right. Um, now, our uh, claim, I suppose, is that insofar as there's been a transformation in democratic politics, it's a transition away from political competition structured between the struggle uh, uh, between left and right, the struggle between rival ideologies, towards political comp uh, competition based on a different sort of logic. Okay, um, and specifically, our claim um, is that we have a form of political competition that's made up of appeals to the people and appeals to expertise. Uh, uh, to give a sense to the title, we're talking about populism appeals to the people and technocracy as appeals to expertise. And so if we want to try and understand modern uh, politics within advanced democracies, we have to think about it in terms of these two poles, the appeals to the people and the appeals to, uh, to expertise. So that's uh, the argument in a nutshell. Let me be a little bit more precise and to try and uh, develop some of these uh, new categories that we're introducing to you. Okay. Um, now, the first thing is that um, we generally think, and this may be what you're thinking at the moment, is that yes, you can accept that maybe populism and technocracy have become prominent poles within uh, modern democratic politics, but generally they uh, they really are opposites to one another. Okay, they exist in conflict. Um, and I don't think we would want to deny that that conflict exists. exists okay? um, uh, some of you may recall back in 2016, there was a, it's now become sort of a, a sort of an iconic moment in the Brexit referendum campaign where the then Justice Secretary Michael Gove was on television on Sky News uh, giving an interview. And he said, uh, I think the people have had enough of experts. Okay? So you get a sense in which the people uh, that he was identifying with really were in conflict with expertise, with, uh, with experts, with technocracy. If you think about some of the debates around climate change, if you listen to somebody like Greta Thunberg, it's very clear that she says we have to follow the experts and not follow the politicians, many of whom are, are populists and are leading us in the wrong, wrong direction. The COVID-19 uh, experience has certainly in some senses uh, expressed this conflict between, uh, between populism and technocracy. Think of some leaders, individuals such as uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, who are often described as populists and have taken a particular line on the pandemic, which is to reject as much as possible a lot of the scientific evidence. Bolsonaro has himself refused to be uh, vaccinated. Other politicians uh, much more in tune with expertise, individuals such as Angela Merkel in Germany tended to follow the science more. So part of the animating sort of um, uh, force of the politics around COVID-19 has been a certain opposition between populism and technocracy. So we accept that that opposition exists. What we try and develop in the book is what Nicola was referring to as this uh, slightly counterintuitive argument, but we hope we can try and convince you uh, today, is that alongside certain elements of opposition, there is also a strong degree of complementarity, okay? which is to say that populism and technocracy will exist in a relationship of, of complementarity, as well as uh, also in various ways, this relationship of, uh, uh, of opposition. So that's the message that we want to, uh, that we, we want to, to push with you today. Now, insofar as they are complementary, they can be combined and that you, you find various syntheses of appeals to the people and appeals to expertise. And these are the syntheses that we describe in the book as varieties of techno, techno populism. I remember presenting some of these ideas some time ago to, to Eric uh, when he came to Cambridge and um, Eric asked me whether the techno part uh, refer to either techno music or technology. Um, and it's not, it's technocracy. It appeals to, to expertise uh, and the idea that they can be synthesized. Now, let me say just a few words about why we think there is this complementarity. Okay? You can imagine scenarios where the two clash, but what, 
what are the reasons for which there is this underlying affinity between populism and technocracy, which is what we argue in the book. Let me focus on, on, on a couple here. There, there are more, but I just want to focus on, uh, on two. Appeals to the people and appeals to expertise are what we describe in the book as unmediated conceptions of the common good. And we contrast these unmediated conceptions of the common good with what we think of as mediated uh, and more uh, particularistic conceptions of the common good that we find in ideological conflict and promoted by political parties as their vision for the vision for society. So insofar as um, these are unmediated conceptions of the common good, we argue that appeals to the people and appeals to expertise are not rooted in a certain set of values or a certain set of social interests. They cannot be derived in any sort of direct fashion from class interests, or as in, uh, in the case of uh, slightly earlier political conflicts, different religious, different religious groups, uh, Catholics versus Protestants or something like that. Um, instead of being expressions of distinctive and specific social interests, we think about these appeals to the people and appeals to expertise as actually articulating a certain claim about truth. They are in some sense certain kinds of truth claims. Uh, populists tend to identify the truth with the people uh, and individual leaders think of themselves as being able much more than anyone else or in some sort of privileged way to understand the interests, uh, understand the people, understand what, uh, to interpret that particular truth. Okay? They are, if you like, interpreters of the truth that exists within the category of the people which they invoke. In the case of um, expertise, there is a different sort of truth, but nevertheless a truth claim of a certain kind, which is uh, the one that is based on um, an appeal to evidence, uh, the, the ability to identify the right sort of policy rather than the wrong sort of policy. It is a truth claim that is not so much a, a moral truth claim as you find with populists, but it's an epistemic truth claim. But the point here is that uh, they are complementary insofar as these appeals to the people and appeals to expertise are expressions of a certain kind of politics or the understanding of politics that assumes or that rests upon uh, the discovery of underlying truths. Uh, so in that sense, logically, I think we uh, suggest that it is possible for the two to be actually complementary to one another rather than oppositional to one another because they are in that sense similar. And they are in, in some ways, then there are some ways different expressions of the same thing, which is some understanding of politics as the discovery of underlying truths. And here I think we have a very strong contrast with what we think of as a form of politics founded around ideological conflict. Because there, what we're uh, suggesting, what we find is that there is at some level some sort of irreducible conflict between these different ideological claims. That conflict exists partly because they mobilize different social groups, and those social groups have interests that are at odds with one another. There are zero sum conflicts that animate the relations between those groups. If you satisfy one group, it's at the expense of another. So the ideologies themselves are the reflections of that underlying antagonism between different groups. Okay? Um, most often, uh, historically, at least, we thought of this in the context of modern politics as being uh, class conflict. It's also the case that these ideologies carry within them uh, visions of society based on a certain set of values. And there is something um, irreconcilable between these different visions of society, such that ideological conflict is in some way conflict that you can only manage by doing what was done uh, in fact, which is to create party systems that absorb these different conflicts into a partisan form of political competition. And the resolution to that is through majoritarianism or through various forms of coalition, uh, coalition politics, which doesn't um, um, eliminate the conflict, but it manages it uh, and absorbs it, if you like, into a stable uh, form of uh, stable party system. Okay. So, Populism and technocracy are compatible insofar as they are based on a politics of truth claims, uh, and that compatibility is not observable in ideological forms of conflict, where you see the, the conflict between rival interests and rival uh, sorts of values play out. Let me say a word about technopopulism itself. Okay? Um, 
And then I'm just going to say a word about some of the empirical side of the, of the book. And Carlo is going to talk about the causes or the, the, the origins of techno populism and the consequence of techno populism. Okay. So, just to be clear, what we're talking about, the, def, the, the, the term that we use is that techno populism for us is a political logic. Now, we discussed at some length what we thought techno populism was. Um, and if you do a forensic analysis of our previous writing, you will note a certain ambivalence on this question. And we have sort of moved on from where we were maybe uh, three or four years ago. So um, we've given this a lot of thought and we define it as a particular political logic. Um, and this logic structures the political competition that exists within a democratic system. Now, we take um, very seriously a, a remark that Peter Mayer made when he was talking about party systems, which he says that party systems are always, the competition within party systems are always about something was the phrase that he used. They're not about everything. They tend to crystallize around a certain key logic. And historically, uh, certainly as revealed in his work, that tends to be an ideological conflict. And therefore parties in the party system have a vested interest in fact, in maintaining that conflict, because that is the one that is the origin of the parties themselves. And so if, if competition is on something else, then these parties may suffer, okay? But party systems are always about something, the logic um, within these party systems of competition is about something. And what we um, argue is that in the case of techno populism, uh, we have a new political logic where the competition is not about rivalry between political traditions and ideologies, but it's between rival syntheses of appeals to the people and appeals to expertise. And that is, the, that is what the party systems are about. That is the something that Peter Mayer is referring to, but it is a different political logic than the one that had existed up until uh, relatively recently. Now, the important sort of point about it being a political logic is that obviously it has what we think of as a structural dimension. Uh, we don't think that techno populism is the property of a, of a particular party or a particular individual politician, such that you can have a party system where uh, techno populism belongs to one, say, party or politician, and all the others are uh, characterized by more traditional forms of ideological competition. Okay, we don't think of it that way. So it doesn't belong to a particular party or a particular um, a particular politician. It's a, a property of the a political system as a whole, and therefore all actors, to more or less a degree, find themselves compelled to act uh, in line with the incentives and the structures of that particular political logic. So. What we're trying to get at with this notion of a, of a political logic is that in some ways there's something inescapable, if you like, about techno populism in the same way that parties who want to operate within an ideological political logic in some way have to play that game. Okay, that's the same with techno, techno populism. Of course, some may play it more than others. Some may play it more successfully than others. Um, and if we were to give up our academic careers and become political consultants, we might advise our clients to pursue techno-populist strategies as routes to, to electoral success. Now, what we find interesting is that obviously for lots of reasons, um, parties and movements can find themselves um, more willing to embrace this than others. Um, and so we have in the book, what we discuss as hybrid cases, which is cases that of parties, uh, particularly that seem to be animated in some way by a more traditional form of ideological politics. Um, and in some ways, perhaps they are driven by that very much and are very explicit about that um, and have been created in an era of ideological politics, not in the techno populist era. But nevertheless, and this is what's interesting for us, even some of the most ideologically charged parties or movements find themselves using the language of the people, appealing to the people, whilst also incorporating into their political offer the language of, of expertise. That's not to say that they are not themselves animated by ideologies, but they are compelled in some ways to play, uh, to play this game by the rules of this techno-populist uh, uh, game. So let me just say a word about examples, then I'll pass over to Carlo. Okay. Uh, in the book, we focus on three cases which we describe as these pure cases of techno populism. Uh, chronologically speaking, starting with the earliest, we have the British Labour Party under Tony Blair. Then we discuss uh, the Five Star Movement in Italy. 
And then we discuss Emmanuel Macron and his En Marche movement, eventually his En Marche party. Now, we can definitely talk about these particular examples here, and we're happy to do that. Those are the ones that we discuss in the book. What I wanted to suggest here, and Carlo and I discussed this, is that um, we, I was just letting someone in, is that we, um, what we try and achieve in the book is, if you like, the construction of a framework, okay, which helps us understand, helps us make more sense of contemporary politics. It wasn't conceived of as a book that could in some way tell us about these particular cases that we discuss. Um, and because what we're discussing is a dynamic democratic political system, parties come and go. Um, so certainly in the case of the Five Star Movement that we discuss at some length in the book, um, today the, 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 the Five Star Movement is not what it was a few years ago. Uh, and it's certainly in many respects uh, 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 on, on the decline. Um, so what's interesting, I suppose, for us is that the empirical side does change and it does evolve. Um, however, our argument is that if you adopt the framework for understanding uh, political competition within advanced democracies, if you adopt the techno-populist framework, you will be able to make better sense of what is going on than if you adopt another sort of framework. That's really what we try and sort of communicate uh, in the book. So the, I just wanted to say a word about the example of Italy, which is obviously an interesting one. Um, we wrote this book um, and finished the book before there were political changes of government in Italy. And what we have now uh, in the Italian context is we have a, uh, a political leader, uh, a prime minister who is drawn from the ranks of the leading European technocrats. Um, Mario Draghi, who was president of the European Central Bank, who brings certainly uh, expertise into his role and the authority that comes with, with expertise, but is in a political role, an explicitly political role. But who are the political supports within the parliament of Draghi? Well, we have parties that we have typically described as populist. So in some sense, the Italian case has moved on from specifically focusing on the five-star movement, which is the discussion of the book, but it's gone in a direction that seems to us to be at some, uh, at some level, very explicitly techno-populist. We have a technocrat and we have a populist support within, within, the, uh, within the parliament. So, for us, this is an example of how there's an evolution in the particular cases, but the, the, the rules of the game are what are shaping the, the, the political choices of these, these actors. Okay. Let me give you one final example before I pass over to, to, to Carlo, was the British example. We discuss in the conclusion of the book, the interesting case of, of the United Kingdom, and we discussed Boris Johnson's time in government, and particularly his advisor, who was somebody called Dominic Cummings, who's written a lot about uh, his vision of politics as being a very good case of techno populism. Um, if you think back to the 2019 election in the UK, which was a Brexit election, the slogan which was successful for the Conservative Party was get Brexit done. And that seemed to us a really strongly techno populist slogan. You know, it aligned itself with a policy choice that was presented as the people's choice. But the emphasis was not on representing the people, it was on efficiently translating that into policy, getting it done managing this in an efficient way. That was really the claim that, uh, that, that, that Johnson made and which won him the election. Now, since then, there's been a lot of up and down and Cummings has left the, the government. But what's interesting is that if you think about the difficulties that Johnson is facing today, and he is facing considerable difficulties, um, I would recommend anybody who's interested in sort of political um, life to watch the disastrous speech that he gave yesterday uh, to the CBI, where he lost his way in his speech and filled the embarrassing gaps with discussions of Peppa Pig. I joke not, this is what happened. Um, the claims against Johnson are about incompetence. Right? It's that he's just not fit to govern. He simply cannot do the job. He's not serious enough as an individual. Right? So again, we find the criticisms of this particular government coming out from the techno-populist logic uh, within the political system. Okay. So change happens empirically, and we've seen it over the time that we've written this book, but we feel that the framework we provide still provides a, a compelling understanding of contemporary political trends. Let me pass over to, to Carlo. Yes, thank you. I also want to begin by thanking the organizers, Nicola, Elias, and Calypso for this. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. As Chris said, what I will be talking about, he described this uh, new logic of democratic politics. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is 
what we call the origins of it and some of the consequences. We use the term origins as opposed to causes for some of the same reasons for which Anna Arendt talks about the origins of totalitarianism in her book on that topic to distinguish ourselves, our approach, which is not to try to identify or isolate some specific independent variables and then statistically prove uh, their causal effect. Our approach uh, tries on the contrary to weave together a number of factors uh, in an overarching narrative that is meant to explain the rise uh, of technopopulism as a new structuring logic of democratic politics. This is what we call a more historical approach to political science. I know that this seminar is supposed to build these kinds of bridges too. Uh, so what is the story that we tell? Uh, I'm gonna begin for 10 minutes to talk about that. The key story, the overarching story is I would say a story of the progressive separation of society on one hand from politics on the other, uh, or more specifically from social conflicts and divisions between groups uh, on one hand and partisan conflicts and divisions on the other hand. That is the main story we're telling. Uh, to, be, to begin telling this story, I think it's useful to get a sense of what is the term of conflict? Uh, what is the term of contrast? Chris suggested that today everybody's a little bit of a technopopulist, but this was not always the case. There was a previous era, the golden age of party democracy, when politics was structured in a very different way. So if we go back to the middle part of the 20th century, uh, the golden age of party democracy, we see that in that period, politics and society were fused together in a very important way. They were fused together in the sense that parties were in many significant respects, the expressions of underlying social groups, social conflicts and divisions. And this is a point that is made effectively and famously by Lipset and Rocken in their 67 article, Parties are the expressions of underlying cleavages. And that this notion of social political cleavages expresses the connection between society and uh, politics. So for instance, a party like uh, Social Democrats or, is supposed to be the expression of the working class. And uh, Christian Democrats are supposed to be expression of the religious cleavage. What we see, so that's, that's how politics was. That's, that's how it, party democracy worked in the middle part of the 20th century. Over the second half of the 20th century, we see a process whereby gradually society begins to change in many ways that we all, I think, are familiar with here. All the traditional social cleavages that existed at the time begin to be destructured in, in, in significant ways. I don't think I need to go into many details about this, but let me list at least three respects in which that is the case massive debates on each of these issues, but uh, class the alignment, which doesn't necessarily mean that class dis disappears, but it's transformed in important ways. Uh, class structure of society today is different from what it was in 1954. Uh, secularization. The religious cleavage is also transformed in many important ways. It doesn't mean that religious goes away, religion goes away, but, but obviously society is religious in a different way and a process that has been referred to as cognitive mobilization, increasing levels of education, increasing levels of individualization uh, uh, as people become more educated. So, so the underlying social structure changes in these extremely important ways on one hand that we are familiar with. At the same time, however, uh, the party forms, the partisan structures don't change as Lipset and Rock and famously say, they remain frozen in place uh, and are not transformed. Uh, famously, Lipset and Rock in their 67 article already say that the cleavage structure of the parties in 67 reflects divisions that existed in the previous century. And so you begin to have a mismatch between the underlying social divisions and conflicts and the partisan forms that are supposed to express them. Uh, and the, this, progressive separation of society from politics, in our opinion, is already beginning to emerge uh, by the 1960s and 70s, the protest movements that we see at that time are an expression of the dissatisfaction or of the lack of uh, match between the social cleavages and divisions and the political partisan divisions. And so already we see that this mismatch is beginning by the 60s and 70s, 
However, the partisan structures don't change. They remain frozen in place for a very long time. Uh, throughout the 70s and even the 80s, the, the mismatch just continues to grow bigger and bigger, uh, producing that gap between a society that is increasingly individualized, destructured, uh, Mers talks about the retreat into the private sphere of society and a politics, which is, as we know, increasingly self-referential, retreating in the state and, uh, and, about, and about power. That is the background condition, but for us, it's not a sufficient condition because we need at least two, in, uh, in our narrative, we need at least two exogenous events, which then happen later to break this empty carapace of a political structure, which has lost touch. Mary uses the concept of foothold in society. The first of these, uh, let's say, turning points we identify is the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet bloc, which undermines all of the most, uh, for instance, in this country, uh, the Communist Party uh, essentially collapses. And as a consequence of that, many of the conservative or Christian democratic coalitions whose raison d'etre was in many ways to function as an anti-communist coalition break down. Uh, so there's a big break in the party systems in many countries that, uh, as a consequence of the Cold War. And in that void uh, that is created, in that emptiness space that is left by the, the situation created after the end of the Cold War, you begin to see the first emergence of techno-populist figures in the in Italy of Silvio Berlusconi stepping in, mixing managerial competence and efficiency with uh, a populist uh, appeal. And our other big case is Tony Blair, uh, neither left nor right, uh, appeal to the people and what matters is what works. Uh, so the 90s, we already begin to see, that as the, uh, after the end of the Cold War, uh, the, the emergence of this new logic where politicians don't compete about whether they're left or right. Blair is specifically neither, uh, but he's both competent and popular. Uh, the second key uh, exogenous factors that we talk about is the, uh, the Great Recession of 2008-2011, uh, which produces, as we know, it, I refer here to Tuzes, Adam Tuzes' narrative, produces a technocratic response by the elite uh, that aims to stabilize the system, which itself then produces a, tech, a populist backlash uh, against this technocratic response to the crisis of the populist, uh, populist backlash. And so, and, after, and in the aftermath of the crisis, you get the, the real uh, emergence of the techno-populist periods, the, the, the era of techno-populism really emerges with even more uh, political parties and forms of politics that express the synthesis of populist and technocratic elements. One we refer to is the Five Star Movement uh, that specifically is, is markets itself as a populist anti-elite system, but they use the web to harness the collective intelligence of all the people to produce efficient solutions. Uh, for they're neither left nor right, of course, that's de rigueur aujourd'hui, uh, today. Uh, and then uh, another figure that we talk about is Emmanuel Macron, who runs against the establishment uh, as, in this kind of populist, personalistic uh, uh, campaign. Mm, his initials are the initials of his movement. Uh, and so techno populism really is a post crisis uh, phenomenon. Uh, just to summarize the, our origin story that I've tried briefly to reconstruct here, the, the, the theoretical point that we have is this stems really from the long-standing and decades-long process of separation of society from politics in the following sense, that when you have a society that is individualized, retreated into the private, destructured on one hand, and a politics that is also self-referential on the other hand, Politicians don't encounter an incentive to try to appeal to specific groups within society, to appeal to the working class, who is the working class, to appeal to a religious group, who is a Christian today. They acquire an, an incentive to appeal to what Chris called these unmediated conceptions of the public good, to appeal to the whole, to appeal to the people as a whole, to appeal to competence, to expertise, because those are not specific groups. You have a destructured society. If you want to win votes today, you appeal to the whole. And populism and technocracy have these, this thing in common that they are appeals not to the part, but to the society as a whole, to a destructured, unmediated uh, 
society. So it's not a coincidence that in the aftermath of the Great Recession, you have the fluorescence of technopopulism, because populism and technocracies are ways of winning elections in a situation of radical separation between society and politics that we encounter today. That's our origin story. I move to, to the second part of my presentation, which is what are the consequences of this? What happens to politics uh, in uh, the age of technopopulism? And again, here, we prefer not to adopt this causal language of uh, uh, trying to identify specific consequences, but to situate the rise of technopopulism within a broader context and tie it to some of the other things that are going on in contemporary politics. Uh, and we focus here in particular on three aspects of contemporary politics that, I th that we think can be related to the rise of technopopulism as features. And we I'll briefly go over those three and then hopefully we can have a discussion. First consequence of technopopulism we identify is what we call increasing conflictuality or toxicity of politics. Uh, and this is tied to, so uh, this is something has been widely observed, affective polarization. Uh, the idea that politicians today do not see each other as adversaries anymore, they see each other as enemies. They do not, they, the, the attacks have become personal. They have not become, they're ceasing to be political. They question each other's morality, each other's motives. That's the toxicity of contemporary politics. Uh, Grillo referred to Berlusconi as lo psiconano and referred to Monti as rigor Monti. So this kind of really personal attack. Uh, for us, it's deeply tied to the emergence of populism and technocracy as the new structuring poles of politics for precisely one of the things that they have in common. When you appeal to a politics of truth or when you appeal to the interests of the whole, the other, the opponent, if he's not part of the whole, he can only be an enemy. If he, if he doesn't have the truth, then he must be in error or he is motivated by evil interests. So when you claim to stand for the people as a whole or to possess the truth, obviously the idea of legitimate opposition becomes impossible and the opponent becomes an enemy. So that's one way in which technopopulism feeds into the increasing toxicity of contemporary politics. A second consequence we talk about is uh, what we call desubstantialization of contemporary politics. Again, something that has been commented upon a lot in the empirical literature, we all know about this, but policy differences recede into the background today. Elections are not really about policy difference. They're about personality traits. They're about the personalization, their spectacularization. These are all terms in the literature. Personality traits, competence, uh, Peppa Pig, is it good or bad that you mention her? That, that's what politics becomes about. Concrete policy differences re recede in the background and politics becomes more about personal traits. And what, uh, using a, an expression from Ilvio Diamanti, we call the politics of doing. Politicians just have to be able to do. Doesn't matter what you do, but il fare. Renzi, the poli la politica del fare. Doing is more important than what you do. And again, here we see some of the origins of this in some of the features that populism and technocracy have in common and therefore in the techno-populist logic. Because if you're not trying to appeal to the interests of a particular group within society, but you're trying to appeal to a destructured whole, you have an incentive as a politician to dilute your concrete policy proposals because policies actually involve trade-offs most of the time and conflict. Actually, it's better to try to de dilute your policy proposals, use vague ideas about how what I'm doing is in the interest of the whole to appeal to uh, uh, as many people as possible rather than a specific group within society. So to the extent that politics becomes techno-populist, it also becomes less substantial, less about concrete policy differences and more about these personal traits of politicians. What's interesting here is that if the two, cons the two consequences, the first two consequences you talk about, this is, it gives you a picture of a politics that is at once toxic and insubstantial, uh, at once highly bitter, and, uh, and we use this expression uh, uh, in a double citation of the unbearable lightness of contemporary politics. Uh, Fru Kundera and then also Tony Judd use this expression. It's a lot about nothing, much ado about not much policy difference. Uh, 
The third and last consequence of technopopulism we talk about is what we call democratic discontent. Democratic discontent. And this is another paradox which has often been noted, which is interesting, which is that precisely as politicians claim to give this unmediated representation of what the people really want, you are being represented by your politician, and precisely as they claim that to do it really well, to give you good policies, exactly what you want in an efficient way, people hate them more and more. The more they claim to represent you in an unmediated way, the more people dislike politicians. And we know all that evidence. Politicians somewhere below lawyers in the social trust levels, uh, or I don't know, like journalists and politicians are trust in the system declines. Pe precisely as representation is supposed to become more direct, it becomes, uh, uh, it becomes, people feel they are being less represented. And, uh, the reason for this is again tied in for us to one of the things that populism and technocracy have in common, which is one of the things Chris mentioned, which is this fact that populism and technocracy, as well as opposing each other, often oppose the same people and the same things, which is these intermediary bodies, the kind of uh, uh, bodies that are supposed to affect the mediation between society and the state are precisely what populism and technocracy are against. So while on one hand, uh, populism and technocracy stem from a crisis of mediation between society and politics, parties, trade unions, uh, churches, civic associations, and of course, the media, they also reinforce that crisis. Because if there's something both populists and technocrats hate, it is parties, trade unions, special interests, the media, so populism and technocracy both stem from a crisis of intermediation between society and politics and reinforce that crisis. They attack parties and the media. And the reason this leads to democratic discontent in our opinion is based on a well-established insight from democratic theory, which is that actually intermediary bodies are essential to give a sense of strong political representation, strong democratic representation. And the reason, if you want to do it through Kelsen, is that as individuals, as destructured, isolated, privatized individuals, we count for very little at the political level of the whole. My vote is an infinitesimal uh, vote in the po politics of the whole. My, my opinion is not very, which is why we need to band together with like-minded individuals to be able to have an influence at the level of the whole. Mediation is essential to feel that you count because as an individual, you don't count. Uh, and so to the extent that populism and technocracy exacerbate the crisis of intermediation between society and politics, exacerbate the crisis of parties, of trade unions, of the media, they reinforce the very crisis they stem from. They reinforce the sense of a lack of representation. <laughs> and in that sense, feed into the very democratic discontent that they're supposed to emerge from. Which is why the last thing I'll say is that we understand the rise of technopopulism as a symptom of the crisis of the mechanism of, of intermediation between society and politics, but not as a cure for it. Although they present themselves as the cure, more direct representation actually leads to a sense of less effective democratic representation. So technopopulism is caught in this feedback loop with the crisis of representation, where it stems from it and at the same time reinforces it. We have a whole chapter about remedies, which I leave for the next session, which I understand is about, uh, uh, about uh, policy implications or whatever. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I, we look forward, I certainly do, to, to your comments on these ideas. Thank you, Carlo, and thank you, Chris, for this um, very interesting presentation that gave us both a conceptual map um, as well as a historical narrative of uh, technopopulism. Um, I'm sure there are many questions, so I would just open the floor for questions, comments, uh, immense for clarifications. Um, and as well on, on Zoom, maybe um, if you want to intervene, maybe you can raise your hand and uh, Serena could, you know, just uh, plug you in. Uh, Elias, you have a, you have your hand up. <laughs> 
And I actually, we, we, so thank you very much. That's really very inspiring and, and very extremely interesting. And I, I, I more than look forward to, to reading the actual book. I do have a couple of points though, and I would like to sort of share them with you. Mainly, you know, as a consumer, more than a producer of this sort of party democracy literature to which you are alluding. And I want to push you on a couple of things with respect to the term, right? What's, what's, what's in, this, in this term, techno-populism? What is the tech part and what is the populism part? I, 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 kind of, I kind of want to see in a way what happens in a way when, when one part uh, does not necessarily agree with the other. What happens then? How do these politicians that you describe uh, react? So first of all, let me ask you, you know, from the very outset, how much is this different from existing accounts? Like think of political change in Britain, Harold Clark and all these people writing and trying to explain British politics um, in the, you know, in the beginning of the 21st century. And, and they had all this idea, this theory of issue competence, right? Like all that matters now is competence. Being the, the whole Stokes valence, their own claim was that you know they're based on on Stokes and Donald Stokes and his valence model. Uh, the idea that you know we do not anymore compete on on, on our positions and on what you know uh, how we want to redistribute to redistribute in weighted sources, but basically we all agree on the same thing, and it's all a matter of who is more competent to yield uh, you know this, uh, this 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 macroeconomic or otherwise more general goals. And so, um, you know, I'm seeing in a way the same logic here to some extent. And, um, and, and, and you know, and then I, you may, you know, you, you, you may say this is not necessarily a kind of a campaign strategy, it's more than that. But then, you know, I think of, of, car of the cartel party idea and, and the cartel party idea is kind of a more macro uh, sort of uh, example of, of the same logic. In a way for me, the, 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 and then that's another question. If and, and then I'll, I'll try to stop and, and go back if 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 there is more time. I, I'm missing a bit a, a specific component of what it means to be populist. For you, populism is not necessarily um, <clears throat> distinctive from popular. Like I derive my status by expressing the will of the people which I have the authority to enjoy without necessarily that being addressed someone or against someone. This is an, ex you know, the, the populist idea, the idea of, you know, is not only representing some ill-defined, uh, let's say, um, artificially uh, homogenized group. I'm doing that against someone else, which typically is the elites. There is nothing there about that distinction about us versus some elites, or at least I didn't see that in the in the in the presentation so much. And the very and, and then the very very final point is, um, I, it's not extremely clear to me why should we arrive to affective polarization if this is a situation in which you describe. In other words, why don't we arrive to more centripetal as opposed to centrifugal types of politics precisely because of the fact that we now all agree and it's all a matter of who is a better manager in, in kind of accomplishing uh, universally acclaimed goals. Thanks. I don't know whether Chris or Carlo want to So we just do an answer straight away, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, as, as you know, there is a, this enormous literature around definitions of uh, populism. Um, and in some way it's kind of characterized by this search for some sort of essence to the concept of populism. Um, we characterize it I think in, in the chapter where we sort of define our terms as a kind of essentialism, you know, there is something really that is the essence of it and what exactly is that? And so you have this big, big debate. Um, and in some sense, it's converged around this thin ideology idea that, um, that people like Kasmuda and others have developed, um, but there are other sort of approaches to populism as well. Uh, what we try and say in the book, I think, is that um, 
And we do say, you know, insofar as we're describing these movements and parties as populist, insofar as we have an understanding of populism, we don't see it as incompatible to any of that. Um, and it does require, in all the cases that we describe uh, contain this, some sort of sense of opposition between the people and an elite. That sort of, you know, anti-system oppositional forms of um, populist discourse are very characteristic of the, um, of the, the, the you know, the, the parties and the movements that we describe. Um, of course, it's the case that in many instances, it doesn't seem very true. These are not outsiders, if you like, uh, but nevertheless, they use that, that language. Um, so in that sense, I think we don't, we don't depart so much from sort of the mainstream in that respect. Um, what we probably do, which is different, is that we argue that the meaning of populism is not necessarily to be found in populism itself, but perhaps in the relationship between populist discourse and other types of discourse. So if you like, there's more of um, an attempt to situate populism within some sort of broader field of inquiry, rather than to have it as a separate populism studies sort of approach. Um, where we differ a bit more, I think, is probably in our understandings of the other side of techno populism, which is the techno side. So there, when we refer to technocracy, here I think there's something which is important to emphasize, and there there is an identifiable shift. So technocracy in its an original sort of connotation, which associates techni, this kind of particular skill, with kratos, with power. That's historically at least, has been developed in opposition to democracy, in, in opposition to that form of politics. And so you have a sense in which it takes power out of the political realm and invests it in this technocratic realm. What we describe with technopopulism, insofar as we think of it as a transformation of competitive democratic politics, we don't mean that. Now, we accept that but parallel to what we're describing, you may have an important transfer of competences to technocratic institutions. Something that interests me, uh, we don't take, we don't debate that or say it's not happening. But what we say is what we're focusing on is not the depoliticization aspect of technocracy, we're focusing on the politicization of expertise. That is to say the way in which claims to competence and claims to expertise, this appeal to expertise becomes central to competitive party-based electoral politics. Um, and so the techni side for us is actually a very um, deeply political sort of category, the way we understand it, not as associated with these themes of depoliticization, which is what a lot of the writing around technocracy focuses on. Okay? We just take a different, uh, uh, a different uh, uh, focus on that. Yeah. I'm gonna just make two points in response to the many that you made, and they are related. We do, yeah, we go through the standard like populism literature and we assimilate most of it, including the idea that populism, the people is constructed in opposition to an elite. Of course, if you run as a populist, you're gonna run against the elite. More importantly though, I think what's more interesting in the, in the definition of populism that we assimilate from Laclau is this idea that that cleavage is politically constructed. Not, it, does, it is not the expression of a social uh, cleavage. Uh, crucially, if you're reading Laclau and hegemony and socialist strategy, that's the point. There's no more working class. So the, the people is constructed discursively by this opposition. And that's an important aspect of the way populism works, that it is not the expression of a class, it is a way of constituting your constituency from above. Uh, and populism does that by politically constructing that opposition. And everybody does that. Elites famously also do that. Uh, so, and this ties to the second question. And here I'm going to launch a provocation because you asked for it. Uh, uh, how is our analysis different from others? I think there is an, imp and here I'm opening a flank, but there, one very common and prominent analysis of the, today's uh, politics is all about talking about a new cleavage. Instead of the left right, you have the know, winners versus losers of globalization. Or, and that populism is an expression of a new cleavage emerging. Uh, that's a very common analysis. Our, our 
where I think we really differ, and in many ways we assimilate many aspects of Peter Mayer and, and, and of valence issues, and, but where we really diverge is that our argument is that no, Technopopulism is not the expression of a new cleavage, it's the expression of the void between society and politics, of the separation between society and politics, of the fact that there are, that political cleavages have ceased to be reflected at the political level. So uh, that, uh, if you will, that uh, political sociology has to be understood in another way. It's not that simple that you can read political conflict into society. S politics is so separate nowadays from society that, that, that who does the five star represent? It's very difficult to do a political sociology of it uh, because they represent a destructured electorate that uh, uh, one appeals to from in, in that populist Laclauian way politically constructs the very constituency one is supposed to represent. And so that's an important, that's very different. That's very different from a lot of contemporary analysis, it seems to me. Thank you. I've got two uh, people on my list. First, Eric Jones, and then online, Tommaso Milan. Eric. <clears throat> no, thank you. Thank you guys both so much. I mean, I, I, I think I first heard this argument in the academic year 2016, 2017 in a paper form, uh, and it certainly evolved since then, and I, I, I really like it. I've got three very quick things I want to ask. One is, why your first turning point would be at the end of the Cold War. I mean, particularly here in Florence, the end of ideology debate took place here in 1958 and had a profound influence on the way we think about the relationship between politics and society. And, and, and if you read the last chapter of Seymour Martin Lipset's Political Man, you'll see that even the author of the frozen cleavage structure that you identified was already concerned about this in the early 1960s. So why is the first turning point so late? The second is, why do you have, as the only two oppositional categories, an ideological logic and a technocracy versus populism logic for ordering a system? First, I, I, I don't see these as mutually exclusive. It's hard for me to imagine a fascist party that doesn't have an appeal both to the people and to science at the same time. It's not for nothing that they always say Mussolini made the trains run on time. Um, it's equally hard for me to imagine a, a, a communist party that doesn't make appeals to the people and to technology at the same time. So if I've got an opposition of fascists and communists, um, then how is that not both an ideological logic and a populist technocracy logic at the same time? Um, and that brings me to my third question, which is if we were gonna imagine a story that got to the three points that you, Carlo, made as implications at the end, could we make it a simpler story than the one you tell? What if we just start with the end of ideology, go through Elias's revolt against the elites, allow for new elites or proto-elites, as Hans Dalder called them, to emerge, uh, to have these proto-elites engage in new forms of political discourse, particularly specific appeals to ideology, or not to ideology, but to identity, and have this identitarian politics then lead to a kind of a polarization, us versus them, othering that you alluded to. Couldn't we tell the whole story that way and then let ID or, or technocracy play an idiosyncratic role from one context to the next, right? So sometimes technocracy is important to this story, Sometimes it's largely irrelevant. Uh, and in that way, we could actually shave off technocracy from the whole thing and then tell a much more conventional account like Ed Luce's account uh, of how, how Western democratic liberalism uh, has fallen into disrepair. Uh, maybe I can try and certainly um, have a go at answering the first question you had, Eric. Um, maybe Carlo can have a go yeah. at, the, at the other two. Um, so certainly from sort of a historical perspective, um, providing any sort of historical account is inevitably slightly messy. So some of these kind of junctures or markers have an element of artificiality about them. Um, to say that sort of at some point everything changes from this date and etc. So 
But the cold, the kind of the end of the Cold War was an important marker for us, and I'll say why in a moment. Um, but what you say is interesting, which is something that we discuss in the book, which is actually the complexity of the post-war developments. Um, so the end of ideology thesis was really quite early, certainly uh, written in the US context, but also you have writing that's already from the, um, from the 1950s onwards, commenting on the attenuation of political competition in Western Europe. Um, you know, so the things that, uh, that Otto Kirchheimer was writing about, the waning of political opposition, those are quite early um, accounts. Um, and they're extremely interesting for us. And some of the language that we develop in talking about techno-populism, um, we take from somebody like Kirchheimer, he makes this distinction between competition and opposition. So you can have political competition in the app, but without actual real opposition. Um, and he says that starts off very early on in the post-war period. Um, and he gives this great phrase where he says, political uh, competition in the absence of opposition is basically like everybody trying to squeeze in the door when they have to clock in at 8.30 in the morning. They're all fighting to get in the door, but they're not fighting about anything very important at all. Okay? Opposition for him, political opposition is about goal differentiation. And so if you don't have important goal differentiation, you don't really have political opposition. So he's making these points really early on. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is that the, some of the trends we identify that seem to us to really crystallize later have roots that take you back quite far. The key thing for us, and, and Carlo was, was framing this in terms of the separation of politics and society, the key thing for us is that if you go back to the 50s and 60s and go back to the writings of Kirchheimer and others, whilst they're making this claim about um, the end of ideology, or whilst people are talking about, in the British case, they talked about butskillism, you know, the fact that on the left and the right, you had basically Labour and Conservatives seem to be saying the same thing. So you have a certain convergence. Whilst that is happening, the structure of society is an incredibly mediated one. That is to say that you have these intermediary groups that we focus on a lot that are very present. Um, I refer you to, there's a recent book by Martin Conway, which is called Democracy in sort of Western Europe. And he basically, his, his account is really of the, 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 from 45 through until 68. And the thing that struck me most reading that book, I mean, it was interesting for other reasons, was just how sociologically dense those societies were at that time. So, what we're interested in telling our story is the separation of politics and society. And we, for us, that's, that's a process that takes a long time and is not really present as early as the kind of the 50s and 60s. It tends to, to happen later. The disjuncture with politics, which is why the end of the Cold War for us is really important, is you have this party system that still reflects these old social cleavages that you know, go back uh, over the course of a century, um, industrialization, class conflict, religious kind of pluralization, et cetera. Um, and for some time, it has been acknowledged that it is essentially broken okay, or unrepresentative, but it is still there. And so the, 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 the end of the Cold War and the way it affected the mass parties, especially of the left, and then the knock-on effects for the mass parties of the right, is important because something needed to give that fairly redundant sort of party structure a good whack. And that it did that. In some cases, it was dramatic, such as in Italy. In other cases, it was less dramatic. But nevertheless, that was the shock that began to generate a lot of change at the level of the party system. So short answer, societies were still very mediated and complex even in the earlier period. Sorry. So I'm going to try to address the other two, even though I would have said, but yeah, that, that I, that's, yeah, that's what also what I think about the first one. But uh, I agree that ideological competition is not incompatible with techno-populist competition. In fact, uh, the argument we make, technically formulated as in the book, is that techno-populism superimposes itself on the ideological political logic, in part replacing it. Basically, left to right is not over, it's just populism and technocracy are becoming increasingly salient. Uh, uh, relative to the left-right distinction. And the proof is that we talk about some hybrid uh, uh, parties and actors who mix both. And one example is Podemos. Podemos is clearly a left-wing party, but also has a populist and a technocratic component. So they can mix and match together. However, we do not think that there is no historical change. I think if you take the 1950s, uh, 
ideological conflict was way more salient than it is today. Uh, deeply, like, okay, some analysis talk about convergence but skeleton, but this was also the time, we cite a passage from Duverger's 54 book about what it meant to be a communist in the 50s. And you go to the party in the morning, you read the newspaper, society was drenched in ideologies. And this meant that there was very significant goal differentiation. People had very different ideas of the kind of society they wanted. Communists and fascists wanted a different end. Which is, in, which is why, in my opinion, valence issues were not pertinent at the time. Because if you don't have agreement on the goals, you can't have a disagreement about who is competent. Competence was, was not so relevant at that time, unsurprisingly, because you had deep ideological conflict. Uh, over time, the salience of ideological conflict, in our opinion, diminishes, and the salience of populism and technocracy as structuring poles increases. That's the narrative we want to say, without saying that the left to the right uh, issue has gone away entirely, but that it has become less important. This leads me to the second question, that, or the third that you raised. Can, could we tell another story? Of course, we could tell another story. Uh, we can always tell another story. The question is, what does each story reveal, and what does each story hide, and other ours reveals some things and hides others. The story you suggested uh, or sort of sketched in that uh, uh, seems to me interesting to explain the rise of identity politics. And, and I think it's a good, it's a good way of, of talking about it. But where you have a problem in that narrative, you say, is you have this idea of competence floating around that doesn't have a role. Our narrative tries to explain, how do you explain Monty, Draghi, uh, you know, constant figures whose whole political identity is their competence. Uh, this seems to me a significant thing of contemporary politics, which I have claimed was impossible, unconceivable to have somebody whose political stature was their competence at the time when you have ideological conflict, because competent at what? If you want communism, it's very different than if you want effective management of capitalism. So it's difficult to agree on who is competent if you disagree about the ends. So our story is good at revealing the, the, the increasing relevance of technocracy and also of populism, which nobody was a populist at the time because there were classes, because there were religious disagreements. Nobody appeals to the people. People appeal to classes or religious groups. So I, there are other stories which would reveal other things. Ours is meant to reveal the rise of populism and technocracy uh, as today's structuring pose. I see that you're dissatisfied with <laughs> No, I'm, I'm just, you know, you're telling a story about Italy. Italy had technocratic governments before. And, and, and Mario Monti and, and Mario Draghi are actually two different kinds of technocrats, or at least one hopes. Um, and, and I think that's fair. If I were writing a story of Italian politics, I would tell that. But, but I have never seen a technocratic president of the United States, except perhaps Jimmy Carter. Um, and, and, and if I was going to look at the, the capitalization of valence issues, they would fall with Barack Obama, who has both valence and identity at the same time. I think it just plays a very different role. And, and that's my point. It's not that, that technocracy is irrelevant to the story, but that technocracy is very different in how it gets implicated in politics from one national context to the next. That's all. So I don't, if I'm gonna tell a general account, I probably would leave that out and then try to capture all these other things, right? And, 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 and I don't wanna monopolize this, but when you talk about the people being mediated, I'm, I, I have a hard time seeing the period from 1968 to 1982 as a period of strong mediation. This is the crisis of governability in a classic sense as all these institutions get rewired and connected to different constituencies. So the traditional left-wing constituency in the mid to late 1960s in the United States is now voting for Ronald Reagan in the early 1980s. So, so I, I think if we're gonna talk about that mediation, we, we, we have to see if the connections remain the same or if they change. And in many places they change quite significantly, right? 
So maybe we can take up this debate in the second session because I've got only uh, another person on my list. I'm told Tommaso didn't have a question. He just happened to be under the hand symbolizing the mouse on the screen. So I'll go down my list and hand it over to Franca. I have a rather more of a question of, of clarification, um, and I apologize up front if you clarified it in your book, which you probably did, um, which I haven't read, but uh, I'm certainly most intrigued after today to do so. So, so my question relates to what what is expertise or what falls under expertise? How how you approach this um, when you when you analyze it, when you observe political discourse? So, are you looking at any reference to expertise, basically anything being branded expertise by a politician, let's say, or the phenomenon of more or less what would be recognized as, as scientifically sound expertise, let's, let's say. And I'm asking this because um, whilst it probably doesn't matter that much for the kind of structural dimension or phenomenon that you were referring to and that you're trying to, to capture and describe, and whilst it would like, um, a kind of across the board or increase in, in references to expertise is already telling in and of itself, obviously, and, uh, and, and the kind of positive observation that you make about politics um, nowadays. I think it, it might matter, of course, at the end of the day, and it might also be, be interesting to dissect it in individual cases and maybe see like with which kind of expertise or which kind of quality of expertise, let's put it that way, does populism or populist discourse and appeals align more? Um, is this something that you that you differentiate in your book? So the, the idea that is that the way we understand it is that expertise functions as a political resource, uh, just like the people. What is the people? Well, it's the terrain of a struggle. Everybody now claims expertise. Trump claimed expertise about which was the most appropriate vaccine or medicines to have. Uh, expertise is the terrain of a political struggle today. Everybody claims it in one way or another. And there's a politics of expertise and it's our politics today. Uh, politics was not about expertise when you had real goal differentiation because actually then it was about different values. If you're it, 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 you stand for the interests of socialism or the working class. It's not about being an expert. You have a different view of society than somebody who stands for the interests of Christian democracy. So th that was not an expertise. The, the, the fight was not about what expertise people had. It was what values and interests do you represent? So that's the claim. And I don't know what is expertise and I don't know which one is scientifically valued, validated. Most politicians claim that theirs is. Uh, and that's what we analyze. There is a sort of um, a body of work around sort of technocracy, which you may be familiar with, but there's a, um, an investigation of, of the quality of those claims with reference to the, the sociological trajectory of the individuals concerned, um, which is an interesting sort of approach. Um, so is somebody who has a PhD and some competence in a field more justifiable as a politician to make some claims about expertise or not? Um, and there's a presumption that in some way the claim about expertise is tied actually to that sociological sort of side of things. Um, I think we probably sort of think ourselves as being fairly critical of that um, and trying to part from it. Um, what we don't do is we don't code the different claims in order to try and sort of sift out <coughs> ones from another. Um, it's not that sort of project. Um, the main sort of contribution is one, to think of it as political rather than depoliticizing, which is sort of goes against a lot of the literature around technocracy. Um, and, then, uh, and then the other is what uh, was Carla was saying. It's a terrain of sort of political struggle, um, irrespective, to be honest, of whether they seem plausible to an outsider. Um, and there is this tendency, I think, within the academy sometimes to kind of be a bit snooty about claims to expertise made by politicians who don't seem the sharpest tool in the box. Um, our point, I suppose, is that that's neither here nor there. Um, the point is, whether you think it's valid or not, those are the claims they're making, and they become part of, you know, political competition. I have another question, but we've we've reached the end of the first session. So if if Taku, if you you come, back, I mean, if you plan on coming back, then I suggest you we table your question as the first one for the next session. Um, we're going to break out for coffee now. I suggest that we maybe for the sake of of time, uh, 
cut down the coffee break to maybe 15 minutes rather than half an hour and resume uh, at 15, 15 past four. Okay, so thank you very much again for a wonderful presentation and a, and a great uh, a great discussion. Thank you. Uh, in the cloister. Okay, wonderful. Don't want to make this great, great. So let's continue basically from where we start. We stopped it in, in our first um, session, and I know there was a couple of questions that were still pending. Um, so let's right. If if unless you disagree, let's let's start with that. Is that okay? Thank you for the fascinating talk in the first first part. Um, well, the second session is remedy and policy implication. I'm so I'm asking something related to sort of you know implication for actual you know public policy and politics. So um, so I appreciate your decision not to avoid entirely the issue of non-majoritarian institution and so-called you know technocratic institution as conventionally perceived and instead working at the sort of logic that doesn't sort of, you know, um, embodies any particular type of institution actors. But um, Peter Mayer, when he wrote um, Ruling the Void, the, he, he, his key premise is that the political space is so much, circum so, so much sort of undermined by the growth of the EU, uh, the independent regulatory agencies and independent central banks and these technocratic bodies. So, um, so I wonder how you see uh, the contemporary relations between 
techno populistic logic and uh, and given that is operating in a kind of already techno you know institutional space where so many technocratic institutions are operating is it kind of sort of you know uh, strengthen the certain type of techno part appeal or is it more like you know conflictual you would say thank you um so thanks thank, thanks for that um so we this is something we sort of worked through actually quite a lot um so my reading actually of uh, and we sort of came to this together our reading about peter Mayer is different actually from what you were saying so um, our impression is that what he argues is that the technocratization, if you like, so increasing delegation to supranational institutions is not something exogenous to national party systems based on the, the sort of the, the greedy, power hungry bureaucrats. That's not his argument. Um, he suggests it's endogenous to the national party system and is a product of the process of cartelization that he describes. And there's a piece, there's a 2009 piece that he writes with Dick Katz, where he does a, a kind of reassessment of his 1995 piece on, on cartel parties. And he makes that connection really interestingly. He says, cartelized party systems generate an incentive for national parties to um, delegate authority to supranational institutions because that's consistent with the downplaying of policy disagreements between cartel parties, which is part of the cartel system. Cardinal parties need to downplay disagreement because otherwise the costs of being outside of power are too high. So the policy convergence you see with cartel parties contains as part of it also this added appetite for delegating to supranational institutions. And that always seemed a really interesting argument because in an explanatory sense, it reversed a lot of the traditional literature which suggested that uh, supranational authorities were themselves trying to claim more power from national governments. His implication was it was endogenous to the party system. I think that's more sort of where we would be coming from. Nicola. Uh, Carla, you want to also? Yeah, I'll, I'll just make a point, but maybe we can also like have a more free flowing. Uh, I think it's a really interesting question because we, ha we haven't quite thought about what you're saying, and, but it's an interesting development of what we're saying. You are right that we don't talk about institutions or actors. We spent a lot of time thinking, is techno-populism a type of actor? Or is it a type of political regime or set of institutions? No, we are in this more meso-level uh, dimension of the logic of political competition. But then, and you're right, but then you say, okay, but there's also going on in a parallel an increase in technocratic bodies, independent central banks at the level of institutions. And you're asking, what is the relationship between a political logic that is governed by technocratic and populist claims and the increasing rise of technocratic institutions? And I think you're very right that there's a very powerful relation. Uh, uh, if you want to legitimate yourself as an expert, it's very good to have been a member of a technocratic institution, like, for instance, the European Central Bank. Uh, and uh, they feed into each other. And these two developments, which are different, as you correctly wrote, relate to each other and reciprocally strengthen each other. And that could be a further development. How? Because I think, for instance, even populists, when they come to power, they want to create technocratic institutions. Uh, very often, when, because they don't want to give power to parties, they create autonomous bodies or ban, for instance, in Hungary. Very much this idea of creating technocratic institutions as a mode of populist governance. So both ways, uh, technocratic institutions reinforce technopopulist politicians and technopopulist politicians create techno technocratic institutions. I think that's very interesting. Ooh. Um, yeah, no, just to jump in on this, because you're absolutely right on one hand. And in fact, we, we all know the polls which show that people tend to trust non-majoritarian institutions more than traditional parties and uh, politicians elected, etc. cetera. 
we, we do know that, but there, there are a number of caveats here. I mean, first of all, a huge variation between countries um, where, uh, you know, I don't know, Scandinavian democracies they, you know, don't, don't show so much of, of this gap for one thing, but more generally, um, the, there is also, <laughs> while more trust in the idea that people have that let's say there is more trust on the what and less trust on the how to summarize it that way there so electorates publics do want these institutions to do the stuff take care of the environment or food standards or all of those good things that we want government to to do and government by experts we want our help distribute vaccines and all of these things, yes. But at the same time, and again, I think the polls show it, plus we know it, the populist side of your equation is also that people are distrustful of any centralized power. Um, and that, and, and, and especially if it's uh, supranational, but it also if it's at the, in London, out there, you know, we know this in the UK, but also in Paris from the rest of France or whatever, the faraway capital, where it's very obscure and strange what they do out there, et cetera. So, so there may be that trust in, in kind of expert governance, but there is also a profound distrust in, or profound unease with the distance, the question of distance and, you know, which is, was in part the, the, the Brexit idea. And so, you know, I, I, if, if you buy this, then um, there is a kind of populist also, you know, uh, distancing from, uh, from purely technocratic governance too, uh, wanting to anchor it probably in more local modes of control um, that are closer to mm -mm, quote unquote the people, which kind of leads me a bit to encouraging our discussion. I mean, people, everyone can ask whatever they want, but also come closer to re remedy side of the story. Um, and well, let, let me state that and maybe I can follow up then on, on the remedy side, but just to, to continue. Great, uh, let, let me also ask Nicola to jump in at this point and then you can collect and who else? Sorry. Can, ah, okay. I mean, Nicola was already also asking to, yeah. Let, let, let's start with Nicola and then, and then you. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. I don't mean to interrupt the free flow, but I, I wanted to take the advantage of not sharing for asking a question. Uh, two, actually, if I may. Um, I, I found the, the central argument of the book very seductive. Um, and, and, and there's something attractive about it. I think there's something new and interesting and uh, exciting. Um, my first question was about one of the aspects of your argument, which I maybe was slightly less convinced about, and I was thinking about it as, as uh, during the previous session, is this idea which you mentioned in your presentation, uh, uh, Chris, but it's actually both of you, because it's in the book, that the technopopulism uh, is a form of or has to do with truth claims. I was not too sure about that in the sense that, yes, you can say that there's a populist claim that you represent the true people and then the technocrats somehow have, you know, truth in the sense of the scientific recipe for achieving any kind of political. But these are two different sense of in which you use the word truth. I mean, there's some kind of sleight of hand here. Um, I was wondering whether what's common to these two formations rather than uh, claims to truth, which I, I don't hear that much actually, uh, is something a bit different. Maybe, I, I don't know how to formulate it, but something that I, I would see as a, as a kind of seamless junction between technocracy and populism would revolve around the issue of interests in the sense that and private interest in particular. And there's some, some kind of moral vocabulary at stake here, at least on the part of the populist who usually are, you know, um, criticize the corruption of politics in the sense of its capture by private interests. 
That would be one part of the equation. And the other one on the technocratic side is that technocrats have no interest. They speak in the name of expertise. They, they know that politics is corrupted by interest and they have the right answers to design uh, whatever decisional systems, electoral architectures, whatever it is, markets, to make sure that there's no such captation. And I think there, the mirror, what you have, you know, in, in terms of what's, what's being mirrored on both sides is the evacuation of any sense of interest. Of, that is of private interest, but that's of interest full stop. I mean, I, I don't know what the interests of the people are. Nobody does. Uh, and the technocrats have no interest, uh, at least officially. So, uh, and this will bring us back to the idea of intermediary organizations representing structured interests. I think there, I think the, the argument seems to me stronger than in terms of truth claims. And the second comment I had is something that came up in the discussion and to me doesn't fit or sounds like maybe a contradiction, but I'm, I'm you know, I, I don't have a, a very clear argument around it, but you said two things uh, and, and I think it was caught. Carlo, in, in, in some of your answers, um, about the narrative, the historical trajectory that uh, took us from, you know, politics as usual, or you know, uh, you know, and to to technopopulism. One was the uh, shift from adversaries to enemies, if I understood correctly. Uh, that's one thing, and the other trajectory you mentioned is from real disagreements, strong ideological disagreements about uh, endpoints, about the state of the world, okay, as you want it, as an endpoint. And today, no, no real difference in, in those terms. And these two trends seem to me quite incompatible, or contradictory at least. How could you have existential or very strong political divisions if you don't have political divisions? Because that's what is being said at the end. And here it's not clear to me how, how you know, how these two uh, uh, sub-arguments or arguments can function together. So maybe I, I would like to hear you a bit more about that. And it raises maybe more generally the question of what's political uh, about technopolitics at the end of the day. Okay. Thank, thank you, Nicola. Carlo and I are both fighting to see who can speak first in, in order to answer your questions. Um, I just had something which I wanted to say. It was on, I was thinking about it because it came up in our discussion outside. Um, and I think it's what, uh, Nicola, you're getting at on your second point. So Carlo may have a sort of different way of responding to you. Um, but we had this discussion earlier on, which was about um, the consequences of technopopulism, as, as Carlo presented it. And you're right to say that there's a seeming incompatibility, incompatibility between, on the one hand, this strong sort of toxic degree of disagreement, and then this insubstantial sort of nature of politics. Um, I think maybe some of the misunderstanding is around um, uh, polarization, um, which is something that we sort of have a discussion of in the book, and we try and make a distinction, um, which is to say that we argue that there is um, uh, enormous conflictuality in the absence of substantive uh, clashes of ideological worldviews. And if that's what you understand polarization to be driven by, then that's not what we're talking about. Um, and the example I just wanted to give, and maybe um, I may be in a sort of um, in, I, I may be the only one here who's ever watched uh, In the Thick of It, um, or The Thick of It, a, a, a British TV series which was based on New Labour. Um, but I was just saying to the people outside, the reason why we have a quote from that in, in the book is that it was a, an iconic sort of series and it was quite um, groundbreaking because what it portrayed was this phenomenally vicious political culture governed by the compulsive use of invective um, alongside the complete irrelevance of any of the issues that people are arguing about. So it seems as if politics was on the one hand deeply divisive and toxic, and on the other hand, not about anything important at all. And that seemed to really kind of capture the, the new labor era, policy convergence alongside complete toxic toxicity. So I think that's sort of what we're trying to gesture at, and that makes it seem less uh, paradoxical than, than it may have sounded. 
So, yeah, and that paradox, this tension you identify is captured in this idea of unbearable lightness. But actually, I think it's no paradox at all. Tocqueville says it very clearly in the chapter on parties when he distinguishes big parties from small parties. And he says, big parties fight about things, small parties fight about personal issues. And so you can actually fight a lot uh, about not, when you don't disagree uh, much. Tocqueville, it's, it's, in fact, co conflict becomes more toxic when it is personal, narcissism of petty differences, it's, it's, it's a very long theme. Uh, you, you, and also in a way in, in Kirchheimer's distinction between uh, competition and opposition. In that example of everybody trying to get in by before 845, you are my enemy, but we don't disagree. We actually want the same thing. Uh, so I think it's perfectly compatible to hate each other without disagreeing. Uh, and in fact, it seems to me a lot of what's happening uh, today in politics uh, in many dimensions uh, at the substantive policy level, it, this is something we talked about over lunch, how much has the Biden administration undone of uh, the Trump administration? It, the, the differences, it seems to me, are at this symbolic, personal, affective polarization. So a distinction that we want to draw, which also captures this is, you can have affective polarization without policy polarization. Uh, in an era in which we agree on everything, we can, we can hate each other much more. So I don't think it's a paradox. It's, it's a well-known phenomenon. Uh, Freud, Tocqueville, uh, talk about it. Uh, uh, Kirchheimer. Where I will agree with you much more is on the first point. Uh, actually, this is another thing that has changed. Uh, uh, in our thinking, truth doesn't occupy a, as big a, a, a role. Uh, it, 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 I think it's better understood as a metaphor of the fact that everybody today claims to represent the interests of the whole. Uh, and a good point of intersection is the general will. The general will, in the Rousseauian sense, is the truth of democratic politics. Everybody wants to implement the general will. We disagree about what the general will is. So. Both populists and technocrats claim to stand for the general will, to do the interests of the whole. And as such, they are not doing the interests of a part. So truth is not, I agree with you that it's not the best language for articulating what they have in common. They, it's much more about interests and the lack of recognition of the conflict, of the possibility of conflict between interests that populism and technocracy have in common. And in that metaphorical sense, there are politics of truth because there are politics of the truth of, of there are politics of the general will without recognizing that there are partisan interpretations of it. Sorry, can I just add something, Nicola? Um, the way we sort of articulate in the book is around a theme which uh, certainly Carlo is more um, uh, knowledgeable about, but it's about the relativism of um, a certain sort of conception of democracy. So we associate party democracy with um, these clashes between essentially sort of irreconcilable interests, but also fundamentally different outlooks about the world. So as an individual, you may value uh, equality much more than individual liberty. Uh, somebody else may have a different value set. The point we try and make is that at the end of the day, it's simply a misuse of language to say that one is right and one is wrong in a, in a factual sense. Okay. What you have are disagreements between uh, a different set of values. And the only way to reconcile it is through the procedural relativism of party democracy. That is to say, if you can build a coalition or uh, win a majority, then you can govern based on that view. If you can't, then you're out of power. There is no resolution to it by saying you're right or wrong. Um, what's problematic with techno populism and noticeable about it is that you have the language of right or wrong appearing all the time. Um, as if what we were having was essentially a factual discussion rather than a clash of values. Attendant to that is what has become, you know, really uh, common these days is to have fact checkers. You know, so it's as if the quality of political debate is determined by whether you get your facts right or not. And it can be resolved actually by whether it's factually correct or not. Um, we then found it interesting that in the response by uh, some sort of people to the contemporary populist era, they would wage what the New York Times called its truth campaign. You know, it's all about truth um, and we have to establish the truth. So 
even though we bring in this language to say it's metaphorical, it's also in a literal sense, politics has become about truth. And that for us is really a, a very dangerous response to some of the problems we associate with techno-populism. Um, and I remember just to give you a, a quick anecdote um, about the impossibility of fact-checking. I remember being in an extremely awkward situation, which was a debate uh, in the UK's kind of um, Brexit referendum between a defender of the Remain campaign, which was uh, the leader of the Liberal Democrat Party, Nick Clegg, uh, and a, a, a defender of the Leave campaign, which was a, a, um, a Gisela Stewart, a, a Labour Party politician. And the two of them were debating against each other in front of you know, something like 2,000 people. It was in this huge place in London. And there were three people on the stage who were the fact checkers, uh, me and a couple of other people. Um, and we had to intervene periodically to somehow correct what the debaters were saying. And the problem was, is it was nonsensical because most of the debates they were having were not factual debates. They were just disagreeing about some basic principles. Um, so uh, that's, I think, what we're trying to, to get at is that techno-populism has this tendency to portray politics as in some way this competition over the truth, over the right sort of answer. And that, you know, uh, is something we're very critical about. So two points you raised. One about variation between countries as one uh, uh, caveat that you raised. Um, and it also, I will address one of the points that we were talking about with Eric outside, variation between temporalities within nation. We tell a big story uh, uh, that is meant to be general, and then it was a bit different in France, it was a bit different, uh, uh, there was this turning point in France in 58, and then in uh, 62, somewhere else. So, of course, there are important, when you try to give a big narrative, I, I do not, in fact, some of our historical chapters and break out into, here's how it went in Italy, here's how it went in, in, in France. Uh, we want to make room for national variation, sub-national variation within, within a big narrative. And uh, it, it's fair enough that, that when we present such a generalizing narrative, somebody like you raises a question and says, but it wasn't like, or it's more complex here or there. And that's the part of the dynamic of how uh, narratives evolve, but because you're right to raise complexity by pointing out to different- uh, Actually, I was speaking specifically about the Trust. I wasn't making the general point because that's kind of trivial. And we all believe in generalization. So simply to make a point about intercountry variation, no, but yes, sure. But you're trying to make a grand narrative. So I'm, I'm happy with that. And of course there are variations between countries and, but then you still, you're just speaking to, uh, you know, gen more general, but I'm just saying that in the, in the question specific sub debate we were having with um, um, the question of trusting in non elected yes. institutions is 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 actually diametrically you know, the the relative trust of polit to politics versus non majoritarian institution is radically different between countries rather than you know the story has been in general different so if we're kind of going into this question of the trust by the people for the expertise institutions you know there are very still to this day significance not just a historical quirk but then my bigger point was in fact that um that you can have at the very same time trust in this these expertise governance at the national or supranational level and yet resentment that power is concentrated there those two things can happen at the same time even though they're contradictory yeah so let me just that i took that to be the second point but maybe it was the same point yes I, and i agree with you you're completely right populists both sometimes trust experts and mistrust experts uh, and in different countries, it can play out differently. What's significant to me to what you say, and very much agree with you on that, is that this is the terrain in which the struggle happens, as conflict about whether we trust experts or not, not whether we're communist or fascist. It's not an ideological struggle. The techno-populist logic is the logic in which politics is fought over, how much are we going to trust experts? 
So I would say even Michael Gove's The People Are Sick of Expert was a techno-populist in the techno-populist logic because it was all about how does the people relate to experts. And in that case, they wanted to oppose it. But that is a form of synthesis of ways of relating pop claims to popularity and claims to expertise. So yes, I agree with you. The, the, what you're pointing out is that techno-populism is not a one-way street. There are many variations within it. Sometimes you relate popularity to expertise in one way by synthesizing them or, or making, and other times by opposing them. But to take what Chris said, we're playing that game now. Yeah, I think, um, I also think, uh what's revealed itself to be the case and this is where we've seen this over the course of working on this topic <clears throat> is that there was a time if you sort of cast your mind back where populists were studied as um anti-system sort of instantiations uh, oppositional figures uh, etc etc and then there was a tipping point which is a kind of an interesting one which is uh, where populists started to win uh, and so the question then which is probably has been best articulated, I think, by Jan Vernamula is, what is the style of populist governance, in fact? It's not just to study them as oppositional movements within society and what it tells us about the crisis of representation. These guys now are in power, and what do they do when they are in power? And this is where I think, Calypso, your observation is, is extremely pertinent. They have demonstrated, now that we have a bit of sort of evidence, a fairly ambivalent relationship to many of the things which they have been very critical of. So it's simply incorrect to say that once in power, populists systematically dismantle anything that we may construe as technocratic institutions or non-majoritarian institutions, or even, to be honest, supranational institutions. Um, in fact, very often they don't, um, and they have a negligible impact on, on that. And they may be not so interested in, in that or actually um, uh, find ways to reconcile it within their worldview, which is the point that we would say is actually that opposition was overplayed in the first place. So it's not surprising that they should embrace um, technocratic institutions. Sometimes uh, uh, it's because they find themselves politically isolated and rather than being able to rely on political coalitions, they have to turn to independent figures, experts, if you like, in order to govern. This was an interesting, so. One example is in Italy with uh, Raggi in Rome, but an interesting one is in the French case, Macron. He, his first government, subsequent governments, it was a bit different, but his first government made a massive deal about the fact that half of the ministers were experts, independent figures, not politicians. They had this ministry, a minister of sport, and she'd been a, an Olympic fencing champion. They had a leading hematologist as the minister of health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, half the government. Now, part of that is because Macron himself, in his mind, saw no incompatibility with winning an election as an anti-system candidate and embracing the technocratic authority of the French state. But in a practical, more prosaic sense, it's also true that he had nobody to put in his government. He had a real difficulty in finding people coming from across the political spectrum to fill his government. Therefore, he relied on people from outside, civil society representatives, because he simply didn't have uh, the political figures to, to put in government instead. So all of these things, I think, tell us something about the complex nature of populist governance, and that they don't have such a clear um, attitude towards non-majoritarian or technocratic institutions. Okay, great. Let me go to the gentleman who has been waiting for quite a while, very patiently. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the great talk. Um, I just had a comment or, or question um, relating to some of the things you've been discussing already in the second part, right? But um, so you, you have this idea of the sort of uh, growing mismatch between social conflict and party lines on the one hand, and, and you tie that to this new sort of double appeal to a new forms of authority like expertise and, and, and the people. Uh, but then I also wanted to sort of bring in a a separate historical context, which is the growth of the sort of regulatory state, we might call it or something, where we're not looking at political parties as such, but we're looking at, so what are the state actually doing? What are the tasks at hand? What are being challenged um, in the political system? And you know, the, the golden age of, of party politics, as you call it, is also the first golden age of the regulatory state. It's the first massive expansion of of, of what politics is about, uh, you know, uh, from having not played a role on the factory floor in the cornfields inside people's home, the state is suddenly everywhere in the first half of the 20th century, 
also, of course, partly because much of that time was spent being at war, where you basically transformed the whole society into a command economy, very centralized uh, from, from, from the capitals and, and you know, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of different things. And then, you know, the century continues as a one-way street in this regard. The second half of the century is a second revolution of regulatory policy, environmental regulation, transnational regulation, the European Union, you, you get all sorts of new, you know, forms of policy. So I think you're right in saying that it's wrong to think about this as a depolitization, but we could think of it as others have done, of course, as, as you know, expertification or, or scientification of, of politics. And then for me, the question becomes, well, how much is this a, how much is this a problem that you know, is a direct consequence of the issues we're facing, you know, the climate or green energy in the, in, you know, coming out of the, of, of the wall, how, how do we, how we translate into ideological class conflict? Is there a class conflict in clean energy, or you know, uh, and and how much of, of this is a product of these sort of more political political developments as you're talking about? You know, the this mismatch, for example, between social class and, and political parties. Um, because I think you know, from a Scandinavian perspective, wh where I come from, and which is the context I know best, this concept of techno populism makes a lot of sense, and and it's it, it's very helpful for me to think about these two things as as being comparable because the Danish and the Scandinavian political history is, is a techno published history for much longer than, 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 you know, than, than in other parts of Europe because of various reasons, but, you know, uh, yeah, both the populism thing because the, the people with capital P was never deemed illegitimate after was the Second World War. So that's been the, the foci of, of political parties for the whole 20th century in, in, you know, in Denmark. And because the, the centralized meritocratic political state is, is a very, very strong legacy of the absolutist sort of centuries going before that. So, okay, that's a complete detail. But I just think it's a very nice concept to have. But, but when we think about the history behind it, you know, there's the political party history and then there's the state history, the state development history. And I just wanted to have your comments on like, how do we yeah, put that into the equation sort of, so to speak. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I like the way the most difficult questions get left to the end, just when we're getting tired. Um, <laughs> this goes to an excellent question. Um, I mean, there are, I think we can answer it at two different levels. At one level, um, not to be sort of um, dismissive uh, in any sense, but um, you know, the ideas that we're trying to articulate are not at the same time also theories of the state. Um, and not theories of the regulatory state specifically either. Um, so I think the drivers of, um, uh, of the expansion of modern states and the birth of what we might call the regulatory state um, are multiple. So um, it has its own history, um, which is not the one that we're telling. Um, so um, uh, in some sense, I think we sort of, or, you know, we try and, you know, there might not be a story to tell exactly about the connection between the emergence of the techno populist logic and what you're describing. Um, the couple of things that I would say though, one is, um, is just to refer back to this piece that I mentioned before with, uh, by Katz and Mayer, which is in 2009, which I think is a, I can't remember if it's an APSR piece or it's, it's in a, a journal article anyway, where they review their cartel. It's called the cartel party, a reinstatement, I think the article. And there they, you know, make a lot of interesting connections. And the one that's interesting is about the relationship between the features and dynamics of national party systems and developments outside of the party system, such as, you know, uh, expansion of technocratic authority of non-majoritarian institutions, supranational forms of integration, etc. And what they tell there is an interesting story where these developments um, are actually partly driven by the changes within the party system itself. Um, so insofar as we're telling a story about the, uh, the political the structuring logic of a democratic politics of a, of a national democratic party system, uh, I think we would say that those changes do have, you know, in an endogenous sense, an impact on some of these developments. Um, it's not what we focus on as the main focus of our book, but analytically speaking, the kind of tradition that we're arguing from is one that has made that claim. And certainly reading that 2009 article, uh, it was always fairly compelling to us. And it provided actually quite an interesting connection to 
um, not the politicization of expertise, but the birth of a depoliticized sort of regulatory framework that's pan, uh, pan European as well as national. Um, the third point you made about um, the Danish case and the kind of Scandinavian politics, I mean, that is extremely interesting for us. Um, and I think, um, you know, we've always tried to encourage um, empirical pieces using this framework in areas that are not immediately familiar to us or less familiar to us. Um, and since we've, you know, started working on this and since the books come out, there's been a lot of stuff on, you know, a lot of stuff on Central and Eastern Europe, uh, focusing on a number of countries there. There's, you know, work that's been done on, uh, on India, um, uh, something on tracing some of these arguments within the specific national lens of Denmark or Sweden or some of the Scandinavian, that would be a really interesting project. Um, so it's, you know, thanks for that comment. That's really helpful for us. It's a restatement of what he would say, said, because it's in a way, you, yours was another way of framing the really interesting question that he posed. You, you called it technocratic institutions, you called it regulatory state. I think they are two separate issues. It's not what we're talking about, but there are interesting relations to talk about and how the rise of the regulatory state functions in a vague way of legitimizing expertise as a valid political resource, which is what we are talking about. Don't want to preempt any question, but perhaps we can come back to the promise of talking a bit more about remedies, although, of course, it's come in and out in various ways, but maybe kind of to address it um, front and center. And I read the book a while back, but of course, there is um, the, the golden road, as it were, um, has to do with, of finding ways of rehabilitating real party politics and real ideological debates, explicit um, confrontation, even of incommensurate values, but at least putting, putting them on the table. So that's definitely one road that, you know, you may want to share more about how, how do you do this? How do you, who does it? <laughs> um, I guess you must both be very involved in the political parties if you put your monies or your boots where your mouth is. So maybe you can share with us that. Many of us around this table have been involved in politics one way or another. And in fact, to me, this is the 101. You know, when I discuss this kind of things with my students, kind of say, well, there are these fundamental questions where you, if you are political, if you care about the collective, the polity, you know, it's all great to be in mo social movements, NGOs, etc. Absolutely not wrong, but you know, don't diss political parties. <laughs> That's where the power is, and and maybe you can change political parties. So th there's a whole story there. Yes. Now, on the other hand, and this is not an in an alternative for me. There is the bigger the, the other conversation we're having in the context also the conference on the future of Europe, but you know, in the context of the deliberative participatory wave, different ways of doing politics, 21st century experiments, democratic innovation, radical democracy, all of that, with all of the pitfalls involved. But to me, that also represents a kind of way forward. And I know from talking a bit with with you guys that you're a bit skeptical. So it, it would be kind of nice to, to discuss this. Um, and I, I would simply say that, you, you know, techniques like sortition and, you know, um, Andrea here will say that we discussed this intensely in class this morning, but, um, and the whole idea that of descriptive representation of direct involvement of citizens um, in deliberative processes with different kinds of connections with binding decisions and you know, what you do with the outcome and many different debates on how you select and all of that, you know, are a way of bringing back real debate, real kind of issues, real differences without the thing you also dislike, which is kind of finger pointing um, adversaries because the dynamics of these assemblies are not like that. They are pretty serious people and citizens really who get involved. And to me, just one last point, 
one of the value added of, of these democratic innovations um, and citizens assembly is, is that for me, it's also a way to what I call tap in people's fundamental ambivalence. That I do believe that citizens are more often than not ambivalent about many issues. And it's only because of effective polarization the certain dynamics of politics, the one including that you describe as techno populism, that they end up being in some camps that are sometimes pretty insubstantial, but represent a kind of new identity that gives meanings to their life, at least temporarily. But this they can shed away when they are in a citizens assembly where they're just asked to think hard about issues. Now, true to me, there is a real problem in how expertise is depicted in these as if we had the truth and there are many stories to tell about the conference on the future of Europe. So there are lots and lots of caveats, but I would say that this is for me a kind of promising road to try to deal with the most more egregious and problematic dimensions of the techno populism you so brilliantly described. Before, before you answer, can I say that we sort of try to conclude in this way with the, the discussion. So we're all tired, I think. And so maybe you can take Calypso's point as a way also to say a couple of words about remedies. And, and then, uh, so Eric, you have a, sorry, I didn't see. No, I was, uh, I was gonna open up a whole different vein of conversation. So I'm quite happy to, to conclude with Calypso if you. <laughs> Yeah. So please go ahead and then, yeah, so you can respond to, to Calypso and then we, we have Eric's point and then, yeah, and then we. So thank you for that question. I thought this was what we were going to talk about, all about in this second session, the remedies, which is why we didn't talk about it. But your question allows us to talk about what's in chapter five, which is the remedies. Uh, uh, that you have begun to talk about. And I'm just going to make three points from that chapter. Uh, two from that chapter and one in response to the issue you raised about the Conference for the Future of Europe and, and the liberty of many publics in general. Uh, first point that we make in that chapter is about remedies. There is a widespread idea that uh, populism and technocracy can be remedies for each other that because they're opposed to one another, the idea is that uh, we can, populism can find, can be a way of injecting more democracy in the technocratic institutions and that technocracy can be a bulwark about against populism. Our first point in that chapter is that if our argument stands, there is no zero sum between populism and technocracy. They go hand in hand and therefore they are, it's not about finding the right equilibrium. You have to get out of the techno-populist logic. If you want, you have to fight populism and technocracy together. So they are not uh, remedies for one another. That's point one. Point two is, as you say, so what, what is the cause? If, if you want to remedy it, you have to study what is the cause. And if the cause for us is in this crisis, the cause of techno-populism is the crisis of intermediation between society and politics. The whole argument we'd make is rather than having a bit more populism or a bit more technocracy, what we need is more mechanisms of intermediation between society and politics. So against all, like Renzi's big thing was disintermediation, we think actually, no, we need more parties, more trade unions, more civic associations, everything that technocrats and populists both think is bad because it doesn't give you direct representation, we think is good. And in that context, so we, partisanship is the answer to technopopulism, more partisanship, not less. Uh, in that context, we talk a little bit about how could you revive partisanship? And the argument we make there is that, of course, technopopulism stems from a crisis of parties. So you can't just return to the parties that went into crisis. You have to transform the forms of partisanship. And our argument is that one of the reasons why parties are in crisis is because they're not attractive to the kind of new cognitively mobilized population that exists today. So that story of Duverger when in the 50s, I would go to the party, they would tell me what I would think, they would give me the news, this is not gonna fly today, I don't wanna go to a party. You need a more participatory, internally democratic kind of party to restructure these intermediary bodies. And in that sense, I'm in favor of these kinds of democratic innovations within the parties. 
uh, our ways of revitalizing parties is to make them more democratic. Third point, I am, however, very skeptical, indeed critical of these forms of democratic innovations that happen outside and against parties, like the Conference for the Future of Europe or deliberative mini publics in general. After we discussed it at length over dinner yesterday, I came to the opinion, I don't know if Chris Bickerton shares this, but that is a perfect example of techno-populism. You have some experts devising how to allow the randomly selected people to speak without mediation, without parties. Parties' interests, that's everything that we have to keep out. And so uh, deliberative mini-publics in that way are, are very dangerous. Uh, and I'll conclude with this thing. Uh, paraphrasing uh, Churchill, Party democracy may be the worst form of democracy, except for all the alternatives. All these democratic innovations that have been done that bypass the party system, in, in my opinion, weaken the quality of democracy because they reinforce this plebiscitarian techno-populist logic of experts making the people speak in a way that bypasses parties. So I agree with you that we need to revitalize parties. I don't agree that we need to also strengthen these other mechanisms outside uh, that, in my opinion, reinforce the techno-populist logic. I just, I just wanted to add one thing, which is, um, in some sense, the if you go to the literature around political parties, and there's a lot of sort of more normative literature recently around partisanship and the value, the normative value of political parties, sometimes you get a sense that perhaps these are ends in and of themselves that there's some sort of inherent virtue and value to partisanship. Um, I think our starting point uh, has always been that we've diagnosed what we think the problem is. So this, distan this distancing between society and politics, the emergence of this, what, what, what Peter Mayer called this void. Um, now, that's the, it's resolving that in some way is what's important. Um, and it's possible, at least in my view, to in some way revive a party tradition or perhaps to revive a, a party, a single party, in a sense that doesn't ever really resolve that problem. It doesn't really address that particular problem. And that's where sort of what we're trying to stress is that it's not in and of itself valuable. It's insofar as it can contribute to solving the problem of the void. So I wanted to just give the example of the British Labour Party, which was an example that we had sort of floating around when we were writing this final chapter. So we have this, um, uh, this nice diagram in the, the final chapter of the book uh, reflecting what's known as May's Law. And the basic argument there is that parties are more likely to be characterized by important goal differentiation if you empower the lower tiers of the party rather than have a very top heavy sort of the militants basically in the kind of middle sort of activists in the party are going to be more radical if they have some role in shaping policy then the parties are going to drift apart and reflect the extremes for a democracy that is virtuous because it then gives you some sense of choice and in the kind of classic Schatz Schneider formulation, the legitimacy of representative democracy re re relies entirely on whether or not parties provide voters with, with choice. Now, we then had this real experiment as we were sort of working, which was the British Labour Party, which was that it internally democratized. It became easier and easier for activists, one, to join, and two, to have a role in actually determining who becomes leader of the party. That had traditionally been the preserve of the parliamentary Labour Party, and it became the preserve much more of activists. And so you had this surprise result in 2015 where Jeremy Corbyn was elected the leader of the Labour Party, even though most of the parliamentary party absolutely hated his guts. So, and that then reflected this real radicalization of the party in an ideological sense. Um, a lot of young people drawn to the party, um, you know, people who we would consider cognitively mobilized, founded attractive to join the party, which was overcoming some of the obstacles to traditional mass parties that we were talking about. However, um, part of the lesson of Corbynism, which is in some way uh, an era that has come to an end within the history of the British Labour Party, one of the lessons of that is it makes no sense to radicalize if that's taking place, socially speaking, within a bubble. 
and it doesn't actually reach out and connect particularly to, to society at large. And my experience of the way the Corbyn sort of era came and went within the Labour Party is that you had enormous excitement and a sense of getting somewhere within the party and the party changed quite a lot, but its ability to overcome this gap, this void that Peter Mayer characterizes was simply not delivered by Corbyn. And that then became really hammered home when the party manifestly was out of sync with its wider electorate and electorally suffered as a result. So my sort of feeling is that it's an important dimension of it, but the critical question, and this is a really difficult one is, how to resolve this distancing of society and politics, which is this long-term trend that we've been describing. Can I just jump in quickly here uh, on, this, on this issue? Is that when we talk about remedies, I think there's a risk that we should avoid of falling ourselves in the technocratic trap of finding the technical solution that will bring us back to politics as, we would, as usual, as we would like to see it. I mean, politics is messy, it's murky, it's historical as well. So it constantly changes. There's no, there's no science of it. There's, there's no fix. There's no, and, and if there's a fix, it works now and tomorrow it, it no longer works. And I think it's not, so the question is not so much, do we need parties or do we need social movements or do we need you know, network, horizontal, uh, uh, leaderless networks that, that self-organize or citizens assembly. I think it's about how you articulate all these things when they exist. I mean, in the early 2000s uh, in Brazil, there were parties in government, I mean, a party that made substantial social policies that delivered uh, in terms of redistributive justice. And they did so because they were organically tied to very powerful social movements that one kept them under check and to make sure they delivered and also fuel them and, and made them rooted in society. And this is not, it was not either or. It was both, and both operated in tandem. And so I think the question is more about, is itself a political question of strategy, about what you do with what you have, rather than how can we just, you know, turn the page and move back or move on to something that we'll design on, you know, in some sort of committee. Um, totally on the same wavelength as Nicola. You know, the way we deal with all of these issues is usually as social scientists to ask under what conditions. And so um, Nicola just gave the example of Brazil, you can have Lebanon, you can have so many countries around the world where, so first of all, the kind of conditions of possibility is exactly what you're talking about when party systems break down, you know, we're in the, in the, in the kind of Gramscian middle, you know, they haven't, your new called for, you know, logic of parties has not happened yet. And, and yet we, we want more politics. Um, and in so many countries, in fact, yesterday I was discussing with uh, one of our students, the case of Lebanon, you know, where the state has broken down, the political parties has broken down, the concessional, concessionist um, system has broken down. But you don't have to go to such extremes to say that, you know, we need new blood for our democracy and the parties are not providing it. So we need to look elsewhere. Not doesn't mean that it, the, the, the party agenda or the other intermediary bodies, but in fact, I would invite you to consider that intermediary bodies is, is a very broad notion and that actually these innovations could be thought of as actual intermediary bodies or proxies for intermediary bodies, they're part of the same story. They are the link between the raw civil society and you know, the politics that leads to government and power, what is in between. And so, and, and so there is kind of the conditions of possibility on one hand, when we really need it, but also, and separately from that analytically, how you do the damn thing. So to come back to Citizens Assembly and the Conference on the Future of Europe, I mean, you're, you're completely right, Carlo, that, you know, if it is done in a certain way where the experts are speaking, et cetera, that is really problematic. So, my, so many of us working on these issues believe that you need to politicize citizens' assembly. And I think that, goes, that is very uh, consistent with what you're talking about. So for instance, they need, instead of having experts supposedly giving them the truth about, you know, the commission and the council speak in this way, and, it, and it's relatively boring too, 
and it's presented as this technical legal stuff, jargony to the extreme, full of acronyms. No, you have political parties debating in a round table for a certain time in front of the citizens. So they understand what you know the politics of it all is. And they're informed in that way. There's the strong believed on that side. There's this other trade-offs. You present the trade-off, the difficult choices you have to make. And so you make this a kind of a politics of citizens' assembly rather than an expert-led. Um, now, expert can talk about the politics, or let, let's say rather academics are capable of talking. Hey guys, you know, what is the politics of this issue? What are the very, very different viewpoints about this issue? And I think if you accept that, then these kinds of um, innovations are actually really, really, I don't know if I'm going to convince you or, you know, it's a bigger debate, but it's important for us at EUI because, you know, we are welcoming a citizens assembly in a couple of weeks. So I just wanted to put this last word in and wondering if it, if it moves you a, a tiny bit along with what Nicola said. Yeah, I'd rather take Eric's point, who's has been waiting patiently for all the spirit. Yes, please, Eric. Thanks, Elias. Um, and look, I'm. Uh, I guess I have, I have three things that I want to challenge you on a little bit quickly. One is you have a. It seems to me a kind of a relaxed approach to definitions, which is good for this kind of broad narrative, but. But somewhere in the way you think about technology, it seems to be independent of society. And I wanna challenge you to think about technology as being socially constructed. And the reason that I say that is because I remember being in Oxford at a presentation by the Britain's highest police officer about, about the introduction of evidence-based policing. And my immediate reaction was, isn't all policing evidence-based? And it turns out, that it's not. And the difference between evidence-based policing and traditional policing, um, I thought was, was, you know, that was just crazy. People will obviously go to evidence-based policing once they know about it. But in fact, it's now the most salient issue in American politics today. It's called defund the police. Because evidence-based policing suggests that what we ask the police to do is not what we should be asking them to do. And we should have other people do that. But, but the opponents of defunding the police say, the police won't work if we don't give them enough money. So we have two different versions of expertise there and, and, and they're deeply political. And, and in fact, I think if you think of all of technology, it's deeply political. And, and so in that sense, I have a hard time differentiating between what you describe as, as uh, goals differentiation and expertise. Indeed, if I wanna understand Republican party uh, in the United States right now, what they did is they built up over the last five decades expertise so that they could legitimate their goals differentiation. So now I don't know where, where we are in that. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing has to do with, with your plea that we should remediate or intermediate the public. And I agree with that. But the problem is, and this is something that I've been arguing a lot, but you could find probably a better argument, version of the argument in Barry Eichengreen's book on populism. Every time there's a little technological change, somebody clever will figure out how to use it to disintermediate existing elites, right? Because that's the only way you get to power is by doing an end run around the gatekeepers. Um, and so in that sense, populism and techno uh, technology are deeply interconnected because every technological change creates an opportunity that populists can exploit. Um, and, and so it's not just that we're gonna socially construct technology, but, but we're also gonna technologically construct populism. Um, and that, that actually represents a really dangerous situation. Then there's the third point. Um, let's say we succeed in dampening down this a bit. The one question that, that we always leave open is, you know, what are, what are the structural implications of these populists who come to power? And I think Chris makes a really interesting point there. Um, one of the structural implications is that they have to stop being a movement and become a political party because there are all these structural requirements that only political parties can meet and, and movements can't. The other is they have to stop being so irresponsible and start becoming states people, right? The fact that Silvio Berlusconi even imagines he could be elected president of the Republic today fills me with awe that he could have evolved so far in such a short period of time. Um, and, and, and yet, when you think about it, the two most important 
populist parties in Italy in 1917 were the Christian Democrats and the Socialists. And fast forward 40 years, those two populist parties from 1917 were the mainstream. So how do we do that? The structures need to be in place to make populists evolve into something that's system conserving rather than the alternative. And we know what the alternative is because we see it in Hungary, we see it in Poland, and we see it in Turkey. So, so I think while I accept the points that you make about re-intermediation, I think there's gotta be something deeper and more constitutional there if we're gonna be reassured that this problem is gonna be addressed in the long term. Okay, so um, there were kind of three kind of big themes um, there, Eric. Thanks a lot. Um, but just stuff that we can think about, um, obviously outside of this room. Uh, but the a couple of things struck me. So when we sort of talk about technocracy, um, you know, you talked about the sort of technological dimensions or the impact of technology. And there is always a, a sort of a relationship between the two. Um, historically speaking, um, the, some of the kind of really good sort of macro sort of histories of technocracy essentially describe ways in which the evolution in technocratic authority maps the different industrial revolutions that we've seen and the different technological revolutions that we've seen. Um, and so the birth of technocracy as a you know, a short-lived sort of political movement uh, in the earlier part of the 20th century, essentially associated technocratic, technocratic sort of um, savoir-faire with engineers. Um, uh, by the time you get into the post-war era, if there's an association with it, it starts to become, it, it starts to change. Uh, and our, the most recent experience we have is definitely economic knowledge we associate with technocracy. Um, and so the, the relationship between technology and technocracy is quite is quite close, um, and the history of certainly techno technocracy uh, dates back to the serious sort of philosophical thinking around the industrial revolution um, and some of the kind of philosophical outcomes of that. So the two are sort of interrelated, but in our case, I think um, it doesn't seem as if it's um, I don't know as if it's a uh, as if there's a sort of a problem of overlap. I mean, I think what we try and differentiate with is basically what we've talked about sort of on this side of the room partly today, which is the expansion in um, independent institutions and non-majoritarian forms of power, some of which are national, some of which are supranational, some of which are bound up with the birth of the welfare state, some of which are bound up with processes of European regional integration. Um, and that has, you know, um, been, generally thought of as having a, a, an effect of shrinking the political space nationally within nation states because issues are decided elsewhere. Um, what we try and do, and maybe technocracy is a sort of a difficult word to introduce because it is so bound up with that. Okay? Now, for us, we, we just try and think of it as an appeal to expertise made by politicians within the space of political competition. That's the, you know, in, if, if we're going to, and maybe we should rethink whether we really talk about technocracy there, because maybe technocracy is simply semantically speaking too bound up with the bigger story of, um, uh, of sort of non-political forms of authority and uh, the expansion of states and all the rest of it. But that's what we're interested in for this particular story. Um, now, there is a relationship there between that and, and goal differentiation. Um, and the point that we try and make is that it's possible to have a proliferation and expansion in appeals to expertise made within the context of political competition uh, without there being any, any goal differentiation required at all, in fact. Um, that's you know, one of the striking features. It's also the same case with appeals to the people that you can imagine that happening again alongside very minimal degrees of goal differentiation. So we try and separate the two out. What I would suggest, I think we imply that you can't really have ideological conflict without goal differentiation. That seems to me, I mean, that, that I think we're trying to say is, a con, is more of a contradiction in terms. So in definitional terms, that's what we're trying to get at. 
you can have very minimal goal differentiation with a techno populist logic, you can't have minimal goal differentiation with an ideological political logic that's the sort of how we're trying to make sense of it. Maybe that helps clarify, maybe it, um, uh, maybe it doesn't. Um, the final point uh, was just about what you were saying towards the end. Um, I mean, you're talking about constitutional sort of um, responses or constitutional restraints in a sense, or constitutional checks. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we sort of say that we, you know, we seem fairly sanguine about the, the implications for the shift from ideological logics to techno-populist logics for the functioning of democracy itself. There's lots of negative elements, but it's not something we associate with the collapse or the end of democracy. Um, but the point that I wanted to make is just that techno-populism is not something that we associate with political extremes. Um, and in actual fact, it's kind of striking that some of our cases that we discuss in most length are probably what people would consider centrist political figures. I mean, Macron, Tony Blair, these are not political extremists at all. Um, so it's not that we associate techno-populism with some sort of political radicalization. Um, it's, it can characterize people that we would associate on the extremes of a spectrum, but it's really a transformation of a logic which affects parties across the spectrum and certainly mainstream parties competing within the center left and the center right or centrist politicians that's they're as much bound up with these changes as anybody else um and so in that sense i think um uh yeah that's that's just something i think we sort of try and it's not techno problem is not confined to the political margins i think that's an important point for thinking about any implications but the the, the whole thing about what to do i mean we've had this discussion you know, we can't criticize techno populism and then pull out from the back of our pocket a list of solutions to it. It's completely nonsensical. Um, what we did try to do in the chapter, more than anything else, is criticize the solutions that other people were presenting. And so if you look at the chapter, we do discuss at some length the other solutions that are out there, which seem to us, you know, definitely uh, problematic. Okay, great. Is there any other point? If not, then I guess we can thank very much the author. We have tortured them enough, I think, uh, both Chris and Carlo. Um, thank you very much for, for this exhaustive presentation and um, resilience in all this um, Q&A session. Thanks, I um, thanks to everyone who, who participated, also to the, to, our people, to the people who were online both before and, and, and still now. Uh, and that concludes our first uh, session of the renewed cluster of democracy in the 21st century. Thank you very much.